Campbell Public Affairs Institute, which is the institute that coordinates the speaker series. Uh, my Maxwell Campbell and political science colleague, Professor Elizabeth Cohen, will have more to say about Professor Bretschneider uh, in just a minute. What I'll just note as an introduction is that in this series, we strive with some of our lectures to engage perennial topics, and then with other lectures to engage pressing current issues. And I think with Professor Corey Bretschneider's talk about presidential power and authority, we have succeeded at both of those things at the same time. I want to thank Elizabeth for thinking of Corey and for organizing this visit with us here today. I also want to thank the Dean's Office for supporting this series. Uh, Dean Van Slyke very much wanted to be here this afternoon, but another university obligation is unfortunately claiming him. And I also want to thank today uh, and acknowledge the Maxwell School's advisory board. They've been visiting with us the past couple of days. I know that a couple of them have been able to join us here, so uh, it, it's, good, it's good to see you here. Let me just make a few reminders before I turn it over to Professor Cohen. First, if you haven't already done so, please silence your smartphones. Second, uh, there is, as is always in our State of Democracy series, a healthy amount of time for audience questions uh, and comments, and I want to ask you, as we always do, to wait. If you have a question, raise your hand, um, wait to be recognized by Professor Cohen, and for the microphone to be passed to you. And the reason for this is not only so that everybody else can hear you, but that we're live streaming the event, and so we want everybody else to be able to hear you as well. And then, of course, after you're done posing your question, give the microphone back so we can hear the next question. And then finally, I just want to remind you that following the talk, we'll have a reception out in the foyer where there will be refreshments and we can continue the conversation that we start here. Professor Dreschneider will also be there to sign his book, which we have available. So, having said all that, let me turn it over now to Professor Elizabeth. Urgently needed in these polarized and corrupt times. 
is a riskier move than one might think if one exists outside of academia. But Professor Brechner has been a model of a public scholar that we can all follow, and I am following her model. He's published op-eds on Supreme Court nominees, travel ban, abortion rights, and many more topics in places like the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and Politico. And he worked feverishly last year to write the book that we are here to talk about today. The oath in the office could only have been written by a scholar of the kind of erudition and breadth of knowledge that Corey Brechtschneider possesses. But because Professor Brechtschneider is also an extraordinary person, this book can be read by anyone. It is clear and compelling. And anyone who does read it will come away armed with a very keen understanding of that which one must accomplish to be what the Constitution, its framers, and its interpreters consider to be a good president. Once we know that, we as voters are armed to make better choices. I'm not going to get into the substance of the book, since that's what he's here to do. But I'll just say that it's both a good read and offers insights that you won't get from just reading commentary on blogs and scrolling through Twitter threads. So uh, I think it's about time for some of that insight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Corey Brechtschneider to Syracuse and to the Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm not sure what the excuse was for missing that event, but I'm sure it was good. Okay. Um, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here and to see many familiar faces. Uh, let me just begin by observing something. Uh, some of you are young enough to believe that at some point you could actually become President of the United States. And that is unlikely, of course. The odds are against it, but it's possible. I went to school with uh, somebody who's sitting in a room like this, who's now a U.S. Senator, it's possible, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii at some point, maybe he will be president. If you would have asked me at the time, can that guy be president, I would have said, no way. Um, so that's the reality. Uh, what do you need to know to be president? Okay, most of you will not be president, probably all of you, but you will vote for a president. And that also, I think, is beginning to frame our question. What is it that you need to know to vote for a president? Uh, the motivation to run is probably familiar. Uh, if you're thinking about it, it might be uh, the White House and the glory, Air Force One, all of these uh, uh, things that come with the power of the job, the glory, the power. But when you actually look at the requirements for what a president does, in Article 2 of the Constitution, which lays out the duties and powers of the office, right after Article 1, of course, lays out the powers of Congress, Article 2, the powers of the President. And in Article 2, there is a very specific requirement of literally your first second in office. And that's that you recite the specific words of the oath of office. Uh, here they are. I don't want to try to do it from memory. Uh, I do solemnly swear, or you also have the option of saying affirm, that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That is written out for you in Article 2 exactly as you must say it if you're going to take the oath to become the President. And what it does is it defines the job. The job is not about glory. The job is about the requirements and limits of the office. And the fact that it lays out these words that you have to say, uh, symbolically at least, conveys the idea that this isn't an uh, office, it isn't a job where you can do whatever you want. It's one prescribed by the powers of Article 2, which grants you some powers, but also limits it. And that limits it the power of what you can do by other provisions of the Constitution. Article 1, for instance, Congress's powers uh, limit what you can do. Article 3, certainly the judiciary, which might stop you if you do it wrong. Uh, and the Bill of Rights. We'll be talking about all of those things that you would need to know if you want to either be a president or vote for one. Uh, it was conveyed, I think, to me, the meaning of what the office is about best by George Washington in the second inaugural address, by far the shortest inaugural address. It's so short, um, 135 
uh, just a, a few hundred words that I'm going to read you most of it. Uh, this is what Washington said in the second inaugural. He said, previous to the execution of any official act of the president, the Constitution requires an oath of office. This oath I am now about to take and in your presence that if I shall be found during my administration of the government that I have in any instance violated willingly or knowingly the injunctions thereof, I may, besides incurring constitutional punishment, be subject to the upbraidings of all those who are now witness of the present solemn ceremony. In other words, Washington used the second inaugural address to say to the people in front of him, if I don't abide by the oath, if I ignore the duty to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, then you've got to do two things. One is, this upbraidings, criticize me. And the other thing is, subject me, George Washington, to constitutional punishment. Can you imagine a president now doing this? Well, what it was doing was make, putting front and center not uh, the person, not George Washington the man, but the idea that there was an obligation that came with this oath that was taken. So much so that what he was asking for was criticism. Think of how much that contrasts from the way that we tend to think about the office, that the authority comes from the people to do whatever you campaigned on, and how different from many of the motivations that I mentioned. I'll just pause for a second. When I was about nine years old, I got very interested in politics, and I was in a parade walking behind who, to me, was my political hero, uh, Mayor Edward Koch, who many of you remember. And my dad worked for a local politician, and so I got to walk in this parade in Queens Day, the biggest, if you were from Queens, this was a big deal event that took place in the summer. It was very hot. And I was walking behind him. He was throwing his arms to the side and saying, how am I doing? And repeatedly, the crowds were roaring. And I was sort of under him watching all this. It was very hot. I mean, I felt like, wow, this is brutal. But looking up, age nine, I heard him whisper to the politician next to him, you know, I'd really like some ice cream, vanilla. And the politician turned back to the aide who was walking next to me, and he said, get the mayor some ice cream. This guy ran across Flushing Meadow Park sprinting to get the mayor some ice cream. He came back with a vanilla ice cream. Somehow he managed to keep it on the cone, handed it to the mayor, and the mayor finished the parade eating this vanilla ice cream, and I thought to myself, man, not only would I like some ice cream, but what I'd really like is to be mayor. <laughs> the power, the ability to get a grown person to run and get you some ice cream at will, I mean, at nine, that, you know, that seemed pretty good. But what Washington is doing is saying, look, maybe some people in the future, I don't think he's just speaking to the members of Congress that were assembled before him. He's speaking to future presidents. He's saying, even if that's your motivation for getting interested in politics is the ice cream or the glory or whatever it is, that's not what the office is about. The office is about a constitutionally prescribed duty. And not only that, but it's a duty that if you fail to abide by it, there is going to be what he called constitutional punishment. Now, as I said, that speech, the inaugural, was given to members of Congress. It came at a time when presidential speech, as the terrific author, who I recommend to all of you of the rhetorical presidency, Jeffrey Tulis points out, when presidential speech was often framed to members of Congress, a more modest presidency, that changes in the 20th century. And it changes in particular with Teddy Roosevelt, but also fundamentally with Woodrow Wilson, who changes the notion of the presidency by really giving a different constitutional ideal, moving away from Article II. By the way, it wasn't that he didn't know about the Constitution. He had taught constitutional law at Princeton uh, and uh, knew the Constitution as well as anyone. But he had a vision that the president needed to be stronger and needed to be able to appeal directly to the people using the creation of the bully pulpit to rally support, but also constitutionally to derive his authority from the people directly. The election, rather than the Constitution, he thought, had given him the ability to be, and this was his term, a leader. And I think he thought people like Washington were just too modest in their understanding of Article II's limits on the presidency. Now, what that did, that vision, was 
expand the presidency, certainly, and create uh, informal power, one of the most important powers that the president has, that's not listed in the Constitution, but it's one that we need to, in the present moment, pay very serious attention to. And that, of course, is the bully pulpit, the ability of speech. It's only expanded since Wilson's time. Think of Twitter. The idea of the bully pulpit is that you can rally the population, which will then rally the press, which will then rally Congress to pass laws that you need. And now a president, especially in the current error, doesn't need to appeal to the press. Twitter is direct. By the time the press finds out about a tweet, it could be retweeted hundreds of thousands of times, maybe even millions by the time they are able to write an article out about it. The powers only increase. Now, Wilson's vision of the bully pulpit and his expanded presidency, I want to suggest, had a very serious problem. And I'll say what I think that was. Um, Wilson uh, relied on a segregationist uh, constituency for his election. And he is quoted, not just uh, mentioned, but quoted at length in the film Birth of a Nation, a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan. Wilson, far from distancing himself from the film or disowning the remarks, shows it in the White House and really celebrates the film. So the president, who really does more than anyone to create the bully pulpit, doesn't hide from racism, but in a way, if you think about that, uses the bully pulpit to uh, defend it. Now, I mention the Ku Klux Klan because it starts to show I mean, there is no group more obviously opposed to constitutional values, I would contend, than the Ku Klux Klan. How do I know that? Because they say that. Their founding idea is in opposition to the requirement in the 14th Amendment of equal protection of the laws. And their desire to deny that equal protection uh, to people based on race. They, I'm not making that up. We don't have to argue about it. That's what they say. So Wilson celebrating the Klan, it's not just a bad thing. It actually expresses uh, a hostility, I would say, to constitutional values. Now, it's not that Wilson was unaware of the Equal Protection Clause. As I said, he was a lo constitutional law professor at a top university. But from the beginning, the bully pulpit is used in this way. One of the duties of the oath, I mean, George Washington couldn't imagine anything, of course, like Twitter or the bully pulpit even. But one of the things that we get by reflecting on what he says is that idea that even this expanded power of rhetoric, which is not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to say we should have no bully pulpit. Twitter should just disappear. But what should come with it is a recognition that the oath has to be respected, that the speech has to be in defense of constitutional values, not against them. Now. That comes with a other requirement, I think, as we move through the Constitution, that a president also has to respect rights of free speech. Early in the Republic, the Alien and Sedition Acts are passed. And in that early Republic, uh, the following thing happens. The uh, Federalist Party, who is in charge of Congress and the Federalist President, signs a law that essentially says that it is illegal to criticize the President of the United States. They outlaw that ability. Now, one thing that's interesting about the way the acts are crafted is that it is allowable and legal to criticize the Vice President. Now, why would they have set it up that way? The Vice President at the time, Adams, of course, is a Federalist. The Vice President is a member of the Democratic Republican Party, Jefferson. And it is a partisan piece of legislation allowing for criticism of one party but not another. And the legislation is used to go after critics of the president. So newspaper editors and the Jeffersonian kind of newspapers are imprisoned. And even a sitting congressperson, Matthew Leon in Vermont, is imprisoned, despite the speech and debate clause of the uh, Article I and despite the protection of the newly passed right to free speech in the Bill of Rights. Now, how do you, you know, in the modern era, I think it's clear that the right to free speech includes the right to state any opinion, especially certainly criticizing a president is part of it. But how can a modern president 
respect the right to free speech, but also defend, as I said, using the oath, constitutional values. Certainly, Adam's way of doing it is prohibited. And this modern incarnation, I think, does give a way for the president to not ban free speech, but to express, through the bully pulpit, constitutional ideals. I'll give you a couple of examples. These are not what Wilson did. This is the opposite. Uh, George Bush, uh, after 9-11, made the following statement. He said, Islam is a religion of peace in order to quell anti-Muslim sentiment that was brewing up in the country. Now, why did he say that? To try to say, if you are Muslim, you have, under our Constitution, an equal right to participate in our politics. Certainly, our free exercise clause protects it. Certainly, our requirement that there be no establishment of religion. And that simple defense of Islam as a having a place as an equal standing religion in our constitutional system, in our polity, was a way of using the bully pulpit not to attack constitutional values, as Wilson did, but to defend them. Think of another instance. Um, I think you find good and bad, and um, regardless of party. Uh, President Obama, uh, at one point, um, does the following thing. There is a, maybe, many of you might remember this, there is a uh, Koran being burned in the West Coast, in California, uh, by an anti-Islamic preacher. And what does President Obama do? He certainly doesn't, as Adams might have, order the shutdown or the arrest of this person. He makes a statement, though, not just within the United States, but through the State Department to the entire world that says what? It says this person has a right under our free speech clause to express any opinion that he or she wants. And he's expressing the modern jurisprudence. This, by the way, is not a hard case. I think it's clear under our jurisprudence that any opinion, not true threats, not opinion that's going to lead to immediate violence, but any opinion, any viewpoint is protected under our First Amendment in our modern jurisprudence. And what Obama is saying, even though that is the, the requirement, that I respect that right to free speech, I want you to know that's not the position of the American government, that Islam has no place here. So he expands on Bush's idea that Islam has a place in the United States and explains why it is compatible with the idea that citizens can dissent and have a right not just to criticize a president, but to any opinion that they wish. Now, that's hard to combine. The use of the bully pulpit, the obligation to speak in favor of constitutional values, but also the requirement in the First Amendment free speech clause that you not use your power to try to put people in prison. That's a view that was missed by the early republic, certainly the Federalist President Adams. And it was also missed by Woodrow Wilson and kind of recaptured in more recent years by these more modern presidents who are able to reconcile this obligation to speak in favor of constitutional values and the right to protect all forms of dissent, even from those very same values, not only to criticize a president, but to criticize the Constitution itself. Sometimes the Supreme Court is going to provide guidelines to a president. I don't think there's any question in those instances that uh, it would have been unconstitutional to try to shut down that preacher. Uh, courts, if that would have happened, would have intervened. Certainly a Sedition Act passed in the modern period would, uh, without question, be unconstitutional and struck down by courts. The courts didn't do so at the time, but they would now. But there are other constitutional provisions that are not like that. So let's take the Eighth Amendment, for instance. The Eighth Amendment, as you know, the First Amendment protects against the abridgment of free speech. The Eighth Amendment bans cruel and unusual punishment. And what about torture? One argument given by several justices, famously actually Justice Scalia did this on 60 Minutes, is to say that the amendment doesn't apply to instances of torture because it's only about punishment after a conviction. That was Scalia's argument. Think of the word punishment that he's dealing with here. And so basically it was an explanation of why the court did not and would not use the Eighth Amendment to intervene to stop 
the extraction of information through waterboarding and other techniques. But does that mean that a president, him or herself, has no constitutional obligation to not torture? I think even if courts don't stop you, a future president, from torturing, you have to interpret the amendment for itself. And that means partly looking to court opinions, we've been talking about that, partly the text, which is just a fragment, banning, um, nor cruel and unusual punishments imposed. Those are the only words that you get. But you could look to the history and the principle. And the ban on cruel and unusual punishment is based in an older British idea that the monarch shouldn't be able to subject people to arbitrary punishment in order to crush them. Not through law courts, but through a king's court. And star chamber and other techniques that kings of England used in order to torture, in order to get people to submit using very unusual techniques, for instance, including ear chopping at one point. The British Bill of Rights banned that. So if you as a president aren't going to be stopped by courts, that's not the end of the story. You have to think about what the clause says to you and the guidance that it gives to you. And one thing I think that's clear from the history is it bans the use of violence in order to get people to submit and be subdued in order to exercise your will, even if it's for a good cause. Many of these people, by the way, whose ears were cropped, <laughs> were involved in insurrection. It wasn't that there was no reason why the king was concerned about them. And I think that history informs you. Let's go on. What about the 14th Amendment? One of the areas in which the president's power is the strongest is in foreign relations. And there are court cases that cut, in my opinion, in defense of the constitutional values that we're defending. Great cases, which we'll talk about and some that cut the other way, terrible cases. One of the worst, I think, in addition to Plessy, which said that separate was equal, and I mentioned earlier, uh, is a case that you might not have heard of called Che Chan Ping. Che Chan Ping is about the Chinese Exclusion Act. It bans um, anyone from co coming into the United States from China or of Chinese origin. There is a person living in San Francisco, a property owner, who goes to the equivalent of the passport office at the time, gets permission to leave to go home to China. I think that a family member was ill. And of course, travel took a lot longer then, and plus the affairs had to be settled back in China. And this person comes back to the United States, still you know, wanting to go back to his house and reclaim his property. And at the border, uh, he stopped. And he's actually kept on a ship outside the border of the United States. Why? In the interim, there was no Chinese Exclusion Act when he left. And before he comes back, it's passed. He's told, Chinese people are not welcome here. He sues to enter the United States, saying that his due process rights were violated. In the modern era, we would say it's clear that this looks like an instance of a violation of the equal protection of the laws. That jurisprudence is yet not yet developed enough for him to use it, but certainly he would in a more modern case. And the court says, uh, basically, sorry, despite your promises, despite the fact that you're a property owner, you don't have the right to come in. Why? Because the president's power is plenary, or basically absolute or the president's power in combination specifically with Congress. This wasn't the president acting alone. It was the president, the administration, using an act of Congress to empower this exclusion. Now, we face this question more recently in the travel ban case. Donald Trump threatened to exclude or shut down all Muslim immigration during the campaign, and then in a variety of different executive orders, one argument is, carried out that promise. Now, they had different iterations. In the earlier iteration, there was explicit mention of priority for Christian over Muslim immigrants coming from Syria. But more and more, there was an attempt, as Rudy Giuliani put it, to take his Muslim ban and make it legal. Now, the Supreme Court in Hawaii versus Trump faced this question. 
Do we have a principle of equal protection, or do we have a principle more specifically that bans discrimination based on religion under the Establishment Clause that trumps in this case? Or do we have Che Champing, plenary power, absolute, in matters of foreign relations? Um, the court's decision is a weird one. Four justices say what I think Frankly, they should have said very clearly, which is, you cannot make law based on prejudice. And the evolution from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus Board of Ed to cases like Lukumi stand for the proposition that you can say whatever you want as a matter of free speech. But when any entity makes policy, it can't do so based on religious or ethnic or racial prejudice. So when the court struck down a plebiscite in Colorado that revoked the civil rights of gay citizens, the court intervened. When a town in Hialeah, Florida, passed a law banning the rights of Santeria to exercise their religion, the court intervened. In both cases, based on the statements of the lawmakers. So in the travel ban case, the statements from Trump, four justices said, could not have been clearer. He said he's going to ban Muslim immigration, and then he did it. End of story. Four justices disagreed, led by Justice Roberts. They said, without citing Che Champing, and that's telling, they didn't want to do that, but they said that there's an extreme amount of deference that has to be paid to the executive, the president, in matters of foreign relations. They didn't go so far as Che Champing as to say it's absolute. They said the president's action still has to be rational. But if there's a plausible reason to think that it might not be based on prejudice, even if we're wrong, we're going to defer. Four to four, what about the fifth justice who decided it? Justice Kennedy, the person who wrote those opinions that I mentioned, can't make an anti-gay ordinance based on prejudice, can't make a ordinance that shuts down Santeria, can't base those ordinances in religious or racial or ethnic prejudice. He tried to split the difference. He said that they're both right. He ultimately sided in the holding with the majority, but he left open the possibility that further evidence might come out that actually it really was based on prejudice. Where does that leave us? The court is not the only source, as these two cases, the last ones that I've talked about, the Eighth Amendment, the Cruel and Unusual Clause, and the Equal Protection, is not the only source of thinking about what the Constitution demands of us. The way that we have to figure that out is ultimately as citizens for ourselves. That's why Washington's speaking not just to Congress, but to all of us by saying, if I do something unconstitutional, not the court is going to come get me. There really was no established judicial review at the time of the second inaugural. But you, the people assembled, stop me, criticize me, say that I violated the oath of office. It's not about any one institution. It's about the citizenry. And the only way to hold a president in check is to call him or her on it when they violate the Constitution. Don't just trust the institutions. There's no Constitution police that's going to come in and automatically, every time there's a constitutional violation, zap the president on his or her head. These institutions require on citizens to speak up and to criticize a president who disregards the Constitution, even if Four say one thing, four say another, and one says I'm not really that sure, as happened in the travel ban case. But more significantly, or not more, but let's just increase the level. What do you do, not of one instance, and you know, I'm kind of giving a lot of one-off examples, cases. What do you do with a president who really fails to heed the message of the oath, who says the oath but never internalizes the message, disrespects the Constitution, not at one point, but repeatedly. Washington couldn't have been so naive as to think that it was just a little criticism that was going to stop him if he was that person. And really, think of how remarkable that is, right? The modesty to say, look, it's not about me. It's about the oath. And even if I violate it, come get me. Stop me. Upbraidings are part of it. We've been talking about criticism. The free speech clause, for instance, protects it. 
But again, what do you do with a president, not in a one-off sense, but who really violates the oath repeatedly? The framers thought about this kind of person. They called him or her a demagogue. And they created checks. Not balances, but ways to stop or check a president. I'll mention three final ones. I'm not going to talk about them in depth. We could talk about them more in the question and answer. One, of course, I think you know what I'll end with, but the two are less obvious, much less obvious. The first one is about the Tenth Amendment, which maybe doesn't get as much play as the others. What the Tenth Amendment says is those powers which are not granted to the federal government are left to the states. Now, how does this have to do with the check? Let's go back to our story about John Adams, who passed that Alien Sedition Act, making it illegal to criticize the president, but not the vice president of the United States, this overly partisan, nakedly aggressive tactic early in the Republic's history. There was no Supreme Court judicial review power to strike down legislation. Jefferson wasn't going to go to the Federalist Court and say, hey, your president is coming after me, and please protect me, and you know, declare the law unconstitutional. Marbury versus Madison hadn't happened yet. So what was he going to do? He didn't have that obvious option that we would all take right now if there was a sedition act. He, this is a remarkable story, he, the sitting vice president, Thomas Jefferson, got together with his good friend from Virginia, a guy called James Madison, who had, after all, not just taken the notes in the Constitutional Convention, but really played the fundamental part as much as anyone in drafting the original Constitution had also played the fundamental part in passing the Bill of Rights, even though he was originally opposed to it. He came around and promised to include it, as long as there was a provision making clear that wasn't the full list of rights. The two of them get together, they go back to Virginia, and they draft the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that say the following things. The Alien Sedition Act is unconstitutional, and no state needs to comply with it. Now, Jefferson and he had a little bit of a conflict. Jefferson thought about, including the word nullification in those drafts, and Madison didn't want to do it, and it was never included. So that word that gets used in the battle over slavery later on, and the battle um, uh, in particular the, about the tariff that's really a proxy for slavery, that kind of really horrible form of states' rights, is not part of these resolutions. It's a much subtler form. It respects the supremacy of federal law, but what it says is that we don't have to comply with the federal government if they're asking local police and sheriffs to lock people up. We're not going to do that. Cut to the current moment, sanctuary cities, which are sometimes called sanctuary cities, that's not really a precise term, but more specifically a lawsuit that Miguel Marquez, a former, uh, the first Latino judge on his circuit in California, steps down, becomes the head of Santa Clara County, and with the allies in San Francisco says, when ICE tells us, local law enforcement, local agencies in Santa Clara and San Francisco, that we have to take people who we've arrested or have stopped for things like traffic violations, if we suspect them of being undocumented, we have to hold them for 48 hours, we're not going to do it. And when President Trump in his executive order says, we're going to revoke all of your federal funds if you don't do it, he's wrong. The Tenth Amendment, and they didn't cite Madison and Jefferson, but they should have because they're in that tradition, says just that. The Rehnquist Court, of course, a usually thought of as a conservative court, established a jurisprudence that says you can't commandeer, the federal government cannot commandeer a state agency or a local agency. The local government doesn't work for the federal government, even if federal law is supreme. And you can't threaten through the use of all federal funds. You can't do coercion through the th threat, like this executive order, to revoke all federal funds if there's noncompliance. That's not allowed. That litigation's ongoing. Who's going to win? The Tenth Amendment defenders are winning so far at the district court level and in the appellate court. Stay tuned. It's one of those constitutional battles against the president that we're waiting for. Let's talk about today's news. I did not plan this, but it is actually unfolding in real time, as some of you will have read. Manafort is likely cooperating. We're not exactly sure of the details, possibly cooperating 
with Mueller in the investigation connected to Russia. Can you indict, can Mueller indict a sitting U.S. president? Everybody agrees that after a sitting president leaves office, he or she can be indicted. Can you be indicted while in office? Look at the framers. What did they say? Disagreement. Sorry, no answer. Hamilton seemed to think impeachment had to go first and that while in office, a president probably couldn't be indicted. James Wilson, a delegate from Pennsylvania, thought the opposite. The ratifying convention at Philadelphia of the federal constitution, he seemed to indicate that, yes, you could, because a president, after all, is not above the law. There is a memo written in the Nixon administration, and other ones subsequently written by a Democrat president, the Office of Legal Counsel during Clinton, that says Hamilton's right. A president is immune. Why? The dignity of the office requires it. Why? The president is unique in our constitutional system. He's not like you or me, or she is not like you or me. They are the head of the executive branch. If they are distracted, the military, the commander-in-chief power, the power to execute the laws, all of this stuff will get mucked up and the system can't function. That was Clinton's Office of Legal Counsel. But there are two Supreme Court cases. That's often thought to be Justice Department policy, by the way. Some people think that within the Justice Department, at least, the Sessions Justice Department is bound by this memo from the Clinton era, which re reiterates, by the way, a view that was suggested during the Nixon era. But now I'll just put my cards on the table. I think that determining the question of whether or not a US president can be indicted by a memo written by a mid-level staffer from the Clinton era Justice Department is a, a mistake. The case of US v. Nixon, probably one of the greatest cases ever decided, concerned the question of whether or not Nixon had to answer a subpoena in a criminal investigation connected to the water break, Watergate break-in. And Nixon's lawyers argued, much like the Clinton lawyers, that he did not have to answer that subpoena, didn't have to specifically turn over the tapes that were requested or demanded by the special prosecutor. Very similar system, by the way, to the system that we have now. And in U.S. v. Nixon, 8-0, with only Rehnquist recusing himself because he had served in the Nixon administration, the Supreme Court said a very simple but powerful thing, and that's why I think it's one of the best opinions ever decided. They said, a president is not above the law. No person is above the law. Richard Nixon had famously said, when the president does it, it's not illegal. And the court said, no, sorry, that's not the way that things work. That principle was repeated in the Clinton versus Jones case, this time against a Democratic president, holding that President Clinton could be subject to a civil lawsuit by Paula Jones. He tried to make the argument about being debilitated, the importance of the president being too busy, and the court said, we'll work it out. You have a scheduler. <laughs> I didn't quite put it that way, but that's my way. You know, the scheduling office, there's a book about it. It's incredible. They can, like, move a nuclear briefcase to, like, Iceland, and, you know, they can do a lot of stuff. They could figure out how to work with a civil or criminal court. So when you look at it, these arguments, I think, fall apart, the scheduling argument. The dignity argument I find most obviously flawed. And you hear this a lot, that the office is such that it would be undignified to hold the president accountable. What's my answer to that? The second inaugural. The difference between the office and the person. These are not the same thing. That's what Washington's telling us. And so the idea that the, the dignity goes to the person occupying the office is just wrong. The office is independent of the person. That's the whole point. That's why Washington's saying, subject me, Washington, to constitutional punishment if I violate the office, the public role that I'm supposed to play under Article 2. Now I'll mention briefly a final check because I, I'm anxious to get to questions and discussion. And um, you know, these things are hard. The indictment question, this isn't like an obvious answer. <laughs> Uh, I think some things are not as hard as that. The Sedition Act is clearly unconstitutional. This is different. Scholars disagree. We're in the middle of a real debate about it. Thankfully, I think the debate's changed a little bit. I think uh, uh, about a month ago, people were saying, all scholars think that the president is immune. And now those of us who dissent from that view are having more 
of a voice. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about that more. What about impeachment? Quick thing on impeachment, the Hamilton argument that because a president can be impeached, uh, he can't be, or she can't be indicted, is flawed. You can impeach lots of people, judges, you can impeach advisors to the president. All of those people can also be indicted. Nobody argues that they're immune from prosecution. So that logic of Hamilton's, I think, is not the way to think about it. But impeachment is an independent process. It demands a high crime or misdemeanor. You might think that sounds just like a crime. It doesn't. There's no such thing. You can look through all the law books and talk to your criminal law professors. There's no such thing called a high crime in the criminal law. Misdemeanor doesn't mean the modern meaning. It seems to suggest, the evidence suggests a kind of lowering, demeaning the office. What the, that suggests, that combined with the process, that there is a sort of indictment that happens in the House of Representatives and then sort of a trial. I mean, they call it a trial, but it happens in the Senate, not in the law court. It's a political process and a political meaning. And I think the meaning of high crime and misdemeanor is not legalistic. The best person on this is not me. It's a former slave, Frederick Douglass, who makes the following argument during the Johnson, first Johnson presidency. Uh, many of those who wanted to impeach Johnson cited his violation in firing the Secretary of War and not consulting the Congress as he was supposed to and not getting permission and just going ahead and doing it. It was a legalistic argument about this legal violation, the firing. What Douglas said was, that's not what's going on. What's going on is we have a president who is traveling around the country giving speeches about the inferiority of African Americans, apologizing for slavery, and failing to get on board the demand after the Civil War of the 13th Amendment that subordination be ended, not just between government and people, but amongst private citizens. That the institution of slavery be dismantled, that there not be a legal protection for one person owning another. Johnson was not doing much to enforce the 13th Amendment, he wasn't a huge fan of it. He was brought on in an attempt to placate uh, those Southerners who were really resistant to the 13th Amendment. And Douglas had a simple point. It's not about the law in this narrow sense of this Tenure in Office Act, of the firing of the Secretary of War. It's about a failure to live up to the oath to enforce the laws, to faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States to do what the law requires. And let's just say that, then I'm on board impeachment. That's what he said in an article in The Atlantic. And I think he's right. When we think about impeachment, it's not a legalistic question. That's the realm of courts, of indictment. It is a political decision, and not any kind of political decision. I don't mean a partisan one. I mean it returns us to what Washington was clearly talking about when he said, if I fail to live up to the oath, subject me to constitutional punishment. He was talking about impeachment. And he wasn't talking about crimes. He was talking about the oath. Now, that oath is taken every four years. We're used to hearing it. It's a ritual. But what I've tried to say to you is that the idea of the office and the idea of faithfully executing the office of the President of the United States are not formalities or abstractions. They're the core to the whole thing. They're the job description. It's not about the ice cream. It's not about trying to you know, enjoy being on this great Air Force One, refurbished or non-refurbished. It's not about the White House. It's not about the glory. It's not about the number of Twitter followers. It is about a simple thing laid out in Article 2, in the oath, but also in the idea of a constitution, that the rule of law is what constrains us as a people, but also that constrains a president. So thanks for listening, and I look forward to the question and answer.
Hi, my name is Paris, um, political science major. Thank you for coming, really appreciated your talk. Um, my question was in regards to what you said about the president making laws in, um, based on prejudice. Uh, my question was, is do you think that today in the society, in the modern age that we're in now, um, that it would be possible for us to vote someone into office that can be trusted to not make or sign off on laws based on pre prejudice, especially based off of the racial, racially divided history we have? Um, and if so, why? And if not, what do you think it would take for us to get to that place? Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I think we have a person in office now who is making executive orders, certainly based on prejudice. And I think that the evidence about the travel ban suggests just that. And I'm not just saying that off the cuff. I spent two years of my life arguing that in a brief to the Supreme Court that was cited by the dissent. And that was sort of given an acknowledgment by the fifth justice, Kennedy, who unfortunately just failed to act on what he knew was the right answer. So it is happening. It could happen again. And the doctrine requires that they do something about it. Now, there was one, I don't know, I, I'm obviously not happy about the outcome of the case, but they did say in that case a thing that was fundamentally important. And that's the Korematsu, the case that allowed domestic people within the United States, Japanese Americans, to be rounded up during World War II and put into internment camps. That that opinion, saying that that was constitutional, was clearly wrong. So. It's not that there really are any members of the Supreme Court that disagree with us. They just failed to act when it came to foreign relations. And my hope is, certainly the law is clear, unanimous, that if this were ever to happen again in a domestic situation, it would be 9-0, and it wouldn't be allowed. So if a future president tried that, to do what happened during World War II, nine justices say, we're going to act. Now, is that make up for what they did, which was to fail to act in the travel ban case. Not quite. I mean, it was small comfort. But, you know, the law is enforced by actual people, including the Supreme Court. So when you watch these hearings that maybe seem boring to some people, that's what it's about. You know, who's going to be confirmed? Who's going to be that fifth justice? We're, it's 4-4 four, four on the travel ban. So who's the fifth? That's not just up to the president. It's also up to a pre Congress that's supposed to vet that person and ask him or her. Now, I watched the hearings, as did many of you, and I was, well, I mean, I'm in print saying this, but I'm very worried about this nominee. Because when it came to U.S. v. Nixon, he seems to have a lot of opinions. He said when he worked for Ken Starr and he was prosecuting a president that it's not only good law, but it applies uh, the idea that you could subpoena a sitting president uh, to a grand jury. Then in a roundtable discussion with a number of academics on the record, he said, maybe that case, U.S. v. Nixon, is wrongly decided. And he had worked for a president. He was seemingly changing his view. There were Republican presidents in office. Maybe uh, when it comes to U.S. v. Nixon, that was wrong. Now, I, I wrote a piece. Um, that was uh, entered into the record by Senator Coons, uh, oddly nominee Judge Kavanaugh seemed to object on the grounds that I wasn't a law professor. You can watch that tape. That was kind of weird. Um, I am, for the record, teaching a, as a visiting professor right now at Fordham Law School, a class on the Constitution and the presidency, but that's not really the issue. <laughs> what is the issue is his defense when he was asked about the arguments that I make in the article. And what he said was, I was being sarcastic because I was responding to an attack that said that we were too aggressive in the Starr investigation. Now, I don't know. I find that suspicious because, A, he seemed to be suggesting around that same time that the Starr investigation might have been unconstitutional to begin with because under that, this case, Morrison v. Olson upholding it, that that was wrongly decided. So that's one reason why I'm suspicious. The other thing that makes me suspicious is even when he defended, and he did say about this case, unlike almost any other, that it was one of the four greatest Supreme Court opinions of all time. Why would he say that? That seems pretty strong. He's clearly trying to show us that he didn't think it was wrongly decided. But every time he stated the holding, he didn't say anything like what I said to you when I mentioned the case. He didn't say a president is not above the law. He said, and I'll try to get it exactly right. In a case, in an ongoing criminal trial about a criminal subpoena for purposes of information 
a president is not immune. Now, what about a grand jury, as is the case now? What about not a subpoena for information, but a subpoena for an interview? He's narrowing the case. He's using a lawyerly trick to try to say, it was a great decision. Why, if you read his Georgetown article that he cites and says, that's proof that I love this decision. It's all about the uniqueness of the situation and the exceptions to it, and the instance in which executive privilege remains. I, I don't know. Maybe he was being sarcastic, but he's not a fan of the case that I read, which is about the idea that a president is not above the law. So there's no guarantee. No, nine justices have said that principle is law, and case law you know, throughout the 20th century supports it. Um, but in the end, you know, who's going to replace Justice Kennedy? Because at least when it came to the travel ban case, that fifth vote made all the difference, and you know, that's your person. So, yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, so my question is, do you believe that the president can pardon himself? One thing about the current era is that the Nixon era looks very tame. I never thought that would happen. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, Nixon, his office of the Office of Legal Counsel. The Office of Legal Counsel is an office within the executive branch that renders decisions about constitutionality of things that the president might or might not do. Now, one thing they wrote an opinion about was whether or not the president, Nixon, could pardon himself. The OLC is not really, a, it's not, certainly not a court, it's not really independent of the president's interests. They tend to, even though they're not the president's lawyer in the technical sense, they tend to be very sympathetic. That Nixon memo says very clearly that a president cannot pardon him or herself. Why? Because the pardon power is other regarding it's an act of benign mercy. Hamilton, I think, called it a benign prerogative. And so the idea that you would use it in the most selfish act to protect yourself, they said, sorry, that's just a bridge too far. They also said that a president can't be a judge in his or her own case. I think that's part of the point, too. But they marshal a lot of principled arguments and founding arguments for the idea that their boss, Richard Nixon, could not pardon himself. So uh, no. I don't think so. Now, let me tell you this. That's, so that's my strong argument for the way that a court should decide it. And this comes back to Kavanaugh. How does this actually get figured out? The president is indicted, imagine. They say you can indict a sitting president, as I say you can. And then the president says, oh, no, um, I'm going to pardon myself. And I'm going to preemptively get rid of all this all investigation. Now, who decides? Mueller says, you're indicted. He says, I can pardon myself. Mueller would say back, no, you can't pardon yourself. That's the violation of the Nixon argument. And that would be Justice Department policy to argue that. Um, it goes to court. And eventually, it'll work its way up to a Supreme Court. Now, what's the vote? Just Justice Kavanaugh? Does he think that a president can part? I don't know. He didn't answer that question. But uh, I'm suspicious about his views on presidential power that he's serious when he says U.S. v. Nixon is rightly decided and one of the four greatest opinions. I think he thinks it's one of the four greatest because of its narrowness, because it was about this issue of a criminal subpoena for information. <laughs> I don't know that he thinks that, but that's the answer. You know, so I gave you my legal argument. If I was asked about it, by newspaper or asked to write an amicus brief, that's what I would say. But in the end, for real, it's going to be a court that decides, including possibly the fifth vote, Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for coming, and I thought a lot of the things you brought up were incredibly important in this current age. Um, in Professor Cohen's class the other day, we were talking about um, Hobbes and where the government derives its authority to rule. And a couple times in your talk, you mentioned that the government derives its authority from the people, but you also mentioned that it comes from the Constitution. And so I was wondering if you thought 
presidential or governmental power really is more rested in the constitution or the people. Mm. I mean, I do think that I'm a Democrat in, in, a, in a robust sense. I think the power comes from the people, but what does that mean, of course, as you've been studying political theory, you see many different ideas of that. And I think there is a vision that, while well, the pre current president of the United States keeps expressing, which is deeply wrong, which is that he was elected by the people so he can do whatever he wants. And it's an insult to the will of the people to criticize him, because that's a criticism of the will of the people. Now, one thing that I know for sure is that is not the view of our, our system. That is a different system. Maybe it's European populism, maybe it's a dictatorship, an elected dictatorship, but that is not American constitutionalism. It's not even close. The American constitutional vision is that the people have ratified a set of principles required, not just that emerge by the people through ratification, but that are for the people. That's what Lincoln said. And it was the best explanation of what democracy is, by the people, for the people. And he added, of the people. I'm never really sure what that of part is, but the, I know what the other two are. They enacted, through ratification, the document, and the document is not contentless. It protects the rights necessary to enable a democracy, the right of free speech, to criticize a president, the right of religious freedom. Those things are all part of the content of American democracy. And they're partly come from the ratification, but they're embedded in the law. And no person's above it. It is the fundamental law of the land. This sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, it, third grade idea, the president can do whatever he wants because he was elected, has nothing to do with our constitutional system. It's a, it gets an F on the, on the grading system of uh, account of American democracy. Hi, thank you again for coming. So my question is about the media as a watchdog right now, and I was wondering, do you think that they're doing too little, too much, or just the right amount, and why do you think that? I mean, you know, it depends. There are some media organizations that are trying to explain what's happening. I mean, I recommend a bi certainly bipartisan website called Lawfare. Uh, one problem with Lawfare is it's great in its depth, but it's pretty complicated. And so breaking down things for people who don't want to read law blogs all day, uh, you know, that's where the gap is. I mean, there are people doing it, I think, but... Um, you know, the way that the Trump presidency has been reported on, the issues that I'm talking about, the constitutional issues, I mean, it's almost like a joke, the idea that you would see this rather than the horse race as being how a candidate was vetted by the media. They don't necessarily know the things that I'm talking about. But yet, it isn't a joke. It's the system. It's the basic job description. And when you're voting for a president, do you know what Article 2 says? You know, that's what matters, not what was covered, frankly, during the last election and not the horse race that you see on television. It, uh, if you want to know what I think, I think there are some shining lights, but most of it is a total disgrace. And the system requires a media that informs the public, and we don't have that. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask, so based on your talk and how you evoked um, Washington's second inaugural address, I'm understanding that you think he was greatly dedicated to upholding the Constitution. My question is, which modern presidents, if any, do you think have done a spectacular job upholding the oath, and why? And if there are none, why not? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty critical in the book of uh, many modern presidents, and I think it just depends on the area. You know, so, I mean, I do think that both in that moment that I was describing, pre both President Bush and Obama rose to the occasion. They did what's constitutionally required by the oath in those simple statements using the bully pulpit. But there are other areas, you know, it is meant to be a guide for the basics of what you need to know to be president. I know that's 100%. You probably know some other stuff besides what's in the book. But one area that I talk about that really all modern presidents have deeply failed on are the war powers. 
Constitution is very clear. It is Congress that initiates war, and the president is the commander in chief. And almost every modern president has basically not thought that to be true. Now, one of the problems is that the court has just abdicated responsibility. There's a doctrine called the political question doctrine. So when Democrat members of Congress sue a Republican president, or when Republican members of the Senate sue a Democratic president, to stop the president from initiating war without a declaration or a resolution. The courts tend to say, uh, we're not really going to touch this one. It seems to be, work it out on your own. And, you know, that's a problem. The War Powers Act didn't help. It gives the president basically 30 or even 60 days to seek approval from Congress for actions that have already occurred. War has been initiated. So that's a bipartisan problem. And I profile a lawyer, a terrific constitutional lawyer, called Jules LaBelle, who's brought lawsuits both by uh, Democratic congressmen and by Republican senators against uh, the opposing party. It's very hard for him to get anybody that's not in the opposition to sign on. So that's a bipartisan, uh, I don't know, you can't state it too strongly, a, a bipartisan disaster where the, the, the constitutions it's obvious. <laughs> I don't think there's really very few constitutional law professors think that, that the president can initiate a war. It's, it says it. There are these legal tricks that I could teach you if you want to try to argue it. They sort of make me smirk when I think about them. Uh, so yes, it's, um, it's a problem depending on the clause. And in some instances, you, you have bipartisan recognition of the Constitution. So I think you, you can't do it in the abstract. You've got to go piece by piece. Um, hi, thank you for coming. Uh, so my question is, uh, what do you think uh, constitutes a case for impeachment, and do you think this applies to the Trump presidency as of uh, the present? Um, you know, it's in interesting that I gave an interview recently. Um, the Fordham Law School has a publication, and the person only had an hour before he interviewed me, so he just read the, uh, the thing on impeachment and, you know, sort of skipped to the end. I think you've got to read the whole book to see my view, because I think impeachment, as I said, is about misdemeaning, demeaning the office. And so to know what qualifies, you've really got to go through all these arguments, some of which I've touched on and, and have mentioned. But... You know, there are also, um, I, I might leave it at that, but the, 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 the impeachment part's the conclusion, I think. We've got to first argue about what the duties of the office are. Again, it partly rests on what the Mueller investigation shows, and if there are clear crimes, willful crimes that were committed, that, that would certainly be part of it. It's not irrelevant to the impeachment question, but it's not the only question. You know, I don't also know that, you know, imagine that the president, just to show you how, how I'm thinking about this, the president, you know, is really bored, this is a future president, really bored in the White House, and says to the Secret Service, I really want to go to the grocery store. And as a lark, this kind of wild, weirdo president sticks a candy bar in his pocket. And he's walking out, he didn't pay for it, Secret Service didn't pay for it, and he's caught. Now that's a crime. Is that sufficient for impeachment? I, I probably don't think so. I think that's like a weird thing to do. Maybe we'd worry about that president looking into other things. So it, it's not just a simple legal matter. I mean, but if the crimes are serious, and then I also think, you know, I'm as I said with Frederick Douglass, I don't think it's just about the criminal law. I think it's about a debate that the Congress has to have about whether or not this president or any president has, has degraded the office, not just at one moment, not one unconstitutional proposal, but over and over again. And if that turns out to be true, I don't think that's irrelevant to, and replaced by the criminal question. I think they all go together. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank I wanted to ask you uh, about the difference between political judgment and partisan judgment. Mm -hmm. At the time that Washington spoke, it was before the rise of political parties, and so when he appealed to the citizenry to upbraid him, he could speak about the citizenry as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, an oath constrains us to follow the Constitution, and if we all agree what the Constitution says, and that's a real constraint. 
But if right. we have a Democratic version of the Constitution and a Republican version of the Constitution, right. then the oath isn't much of a constraint at all. So um, Jeffrey Rosen just had a piece that came out in The Atlantic called Madison's Nightmare, mm -hmm. saying that the, uh, our system doesn't work as planned because uh, the rise of political parties essentially subvert all the checks and balances. Yeah. So it's no longer meaningful to think about states checking the federal government or the branches checking one another uh, because parties reach across all those institutions and levels of government completely organize public life. So the, all the judgments are partisan. Yeah. So in what sense do you think that there's some kind of appeal to the people that doesn't just break down into Democrats yeah. versus Republican? In what sense is there such a thing as a constitution as opposed to the way Democrats see it and the way Republicans see it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess I would say that I, I don't believe that. I mean, I think that the constitution is an independent document apart from our partisan beliefs. It doesn't touch on all partisan issues. Uh, we talked about, um, there was an example, I think, about you know, intervention in, earlier in the day. Somebody was asking about some instance where the Constitution just didn't have an answer. And I think a lot of things are like that. You know, uh, how high should our taxes be? Uh, how, um, how much uh, punishment should um, grand larceny receive? You know, 18 or 21 years. I don't think that, I think within the constraints of the Constitution, that's where partisan politics lies. But what the Constitution does is it creates a nonpartisan set of rights and powers and duties that it is up to nonpartisan judges to enforce and up to even partisan presidents who certainly are going to have their policy agenda, regardless of party, to respect. Now, You'd say back, rightly, and that's a great challenge, but people disagree about the meaning of the Constitution, and I tried to say that. You know, travel ban case, 5-4, and my side's not the winning side. Uh, you know, go through any of these things. Uh, there are some, not nobody on the court, but probably some constitutional scholars who think the Alien and Sedition Acts aren't unconstitutional because the original meaning of, the free, ex of free speech didn't prohibit them. It was much more limited. But there are disagreements about everything. And I don't think I'm deeply, if anything, not, not a relativist about moral values, and I'm definitely not a relativist about the Constitution. And the fact that people disagree and that they have partisan disagreements doesn't mean that there's not an answer to these questions that's independent of our own belief. I'll give you, this is sort of an unfair example, but uh, you know, uh, people disagree. Imagine that there's a kind of person in the room who thinks that when you jump out a window, you you go up, not down. Now, that person might disagree with me, but there's a matter of fact there. Now, the Constitution's not like that. There are much deeper and stronger disagreements and there are arguments on both sides. But I, I don't think that there is a um, non-answer. And I should say, too, in the book, you know, I, I don't try to hide from giving my approach. There is a view of the Constitution responsible for much of the underlying disagreement in all these issues called originalism. And there's a version of originalism that was advanced by the most influential recent Supreme Court justice, Justice Scalia. And what he says is, the meaning of the Constitution has to be provision by provision according to its original meaning. And that means its semantic meaning, or basically the dictionary meaning at the time that the provisions were passed, and as the terms would be understood in isolation by the educated public. Now, I don't think that's how you interpret a Constitution. And that, that disagreement, that theoretical disagreement, explains why we have a deeper disagreement. Now, why don't I think that? That's not how the law works. The world law is worked out through precedent. Cases matter, and so I tried to use not just original meaning in my arguments, but also case law. And precedent is supposed to matter over time. There's been a direction in equal protection law and free speech law. Those cases stand for principles that have legal authority. That's what lawyers do before the Supreme Court. They don't sit there arguing about Dictionaries, they're not historians, they argue cases. And that practice explains part of what the law is in a way that Scalia could never explain. And then finally, there's a third thing. There's the text, he's right, certainly that matters, and in some cases it's determinative, but when it's ambiguous, we look to the principles as elaborated through the cases. And we also look to, and here I am with some originalists more than him, Justice Bork, for instance, had this view. You look to the founding ideals, to the principles, to the values. And so I say in the, my chapter about how to confirm and, and nominate a Supreme Court justice that you have to care 
about not just the provision, the words, but the values that underlie them. No cruel and unusual punishment. What does that mean? What's the history? What's the idea? And so I just think that this Scalia style of interpretation is so truncated, it's so recent. It comes from Ed Meese's office in 1982. The idea that it's this old-fashioned founding idea is a lie, and it's wrong. And so I don't have a problem with saying that. Talk loud. No. Okay. All right. Oh, there, we, there, there we, there we are. Well, I've been in meetings all day, so I really appreciate you uh, sharing the news today about Paul Manafort. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't heard that. I heard yesterday there might be something, something in the works. So my question, um, it may be a really silly one or a, a simple one, um, which is, um, if somebody pleads, can they still? Can they still be pardoned? Um, and if that is the case, uh, does it put the president, if he were to pardon, in a more awkward position because of the fact that the person pleaded as opposed to went through the court system? I mean, if he pleads guilty. If, if he pleads guilty. I mean, presuming, presumably a plead is you're pleading to something, that you did something wrong, right? Yeah. No, I think there I'd say certainly. I mean, the idea of the pardon... You know, it's this benign prerogative power of mercy. And so I think, in a way, it makes it even easier. Because after either a conviction, in which because the courts made the determination, or the acquiescence of Manafort to the charges, saying, yeah, I did it, that's when mercy comes in. It's mercy for wrongdoing. So on that one, I wouldn't say, you know, that there's somehow a, a guilty plea exception to the pardon power. It's the opposite. It's that that, that really is what they meant. You know. They didn't keep the prerogative of the king in many, many areas. The king could initiate war. The president cannot. But they did keep one, and that's this benign prerogative of, of mercy. And mercy is mercy for a crime that actually was committed. So, yeah, I think the president definitely can do it. Now, in the Manafort case, it's not any case. It's a case in which, now this goes back to the question about self-pardoning. It's a case in which the president might be himself involved in the crime. So the question of what a self-pardon is starts to come up again. Does it include people you know, related to you? Does it include your family? Is that a pardon of yourself to pardon your daughter or your son, just hypothetically? Um, how about a co-conspirator? It, it looks like that Nixon logic that says you can't pardon yourself. There's a, I would say, an interesting question about whether or not it extends to self-interest more generally. Now, who's going to decide that? If Manafort pardons himself and Mueller wants to object, sorry, if Trump pardons Manafort and Mueller wants to object to the pardon, that's a constitutional issue. That'll go to the Supreme Court. Thank you for coming. Um, so I want to reference the New York Times anonymous article which talked about White House staffers taking documents off of the president's desk uh, to prevent him from making decisions that could put this country in harm's way. Is that upholding the values that Washington sets forth by saying, stop me, criticize me if I do something that's unconstitutional? Wow. Or does that set a risky pre precedent of White House staffers who haven't been elected by the electorate making decisions for the country? Yeah, I don't think it's what he had in mind necessarily, but it's a great question. Um, I mean, I guess here, you know, I can refer you to the debate, and I'll, I'll give you my view at the end, but I don't want to pretend that this is, you know, there are people who especially hold this view called the unitary executive, which really says the president's the boss. And the president tells his staff within the executive branch what to do. And so this is a violation of that chain of command. Now, in the book, what I say is, you know, maybe you won't be surprised by this, but I'm not a defender of the unitary view. And there are lots of things in the law that run contrary to it. One is the Pendleton Act that protects civil servants within the executive branch from being fired without cause. The other was the independent counsel law that protected you know, uh, people investigating the president from being 
prosecuted. Another is the regulation within the Department of Justice that technically prevent Mueller from being fired without good cause. Now, you know, uh, there are people out there, defenders of the unitary executive, who think in the extreme, I, I imagine there might be some who think the Pendleton Act is unconstitutional. There certainly are many who think that any law, any limit on the president firing Mueller is unconstitutional. And there are some who think the investigation is itself unconstitutional because how can a subordinate tell a superior what to do? Like hand over a subpoena, answer questions? So I'm not with that view. I think that civil servants in the executive branch can be protected by Congress, which has the lawmaking ability and the ability to carry out through the execution of the laws of its will. And that's what the Pendleton Act does. That's what a law protecting the special prosecutor would do. And then I would add a, a second thing, which is that Mueller, members of the executive branch, also take an oath to abide, uh, to uphold the Constitution. Uh, the phrasing is a little different, but basically they, they are committed to the law. So a president who tells them to just disregard the law, I think that puts them in tension with their ultimate obligation, which is also to the oath and to the Constitution, more specifically. Okay, I think there actually are several more questions for her about how we have time now. And I just want to say two things before we go. First of all, um, once a registrator gets a little bit an hour and a half of a lot of law and history without a single note, which we haven't tried to do, is really, really hard. <laughs> Thank you. And third, please join us for reception. Thank you all. Thank you.